Let's just read. Let's just read a verse together, and then. Okay. Second uh, Timothy chapter two, verse seven. Second Timothy chapter two, verse se seven. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made salvation possible for all of us here today and those on Zoom. We thank thee that we can gather in such a way to look into thy word. And we think of what Paul has written here by the Holy Spirit. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So, Father, we just pray for understanding that our eyes may be opened, that we may take something away from what is said today on the scriptures, uh, that we may uh, glean something, that each one of us may be encouraged, may be edified, may be uh, instructed in the word of God. So we just thank thee for this time together. In the name of thy son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So you know that the study that we've been doing, we've been going through this chart, and I think Lisa sent out the chart again. And I sent out <clears throat> one that was completed except for uh, the section on Paul. So let's just uh, go back and just do like a just a quickie, quickie review. And you'll remember that uh, we were looking at uh, the four faces. So let's go back to Ezekiel. Is my volume okay? Hello? Is my volume okay? Sounds good here. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Okay. So let's uh, read Ezekiel 1.10. As for the likeness of their faces... Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So I was thinking about this uh, this weekend, the past week, and uh, I, I came up with, you know, I like Lego, right? So. I was thinking if, I mean, I don't, I don't know if they had square heads, these cherubim, and there was one in each corner around the throne, right? So I, what I did was I made up this little, this little, uh, pretend this is the neck of the cherubim and I'm of the cherub. So if you look at the front, you see a man. And then if you look on the right side, you see the lion, you look on the left side, you see the ox, and then on the back side, you see the eagle. So around the throne of God, uh, these created beings were there. And if you look at the front, as we studied the man, and we understood that Luke was the writer that brought before us Christ as the perfect man. But if you look directly behind, you see the eagle. So while he was a man, we learned that in John, he was actually God manifest in flesh. Then when you look on the left side, you have the ox or the, uh, or the calf. And we learned that, that an ox or a calf or they were beasts of burden. They were a servant. They served man, right? So we learned that in Mark, we have the beautiful picture of Christ as the perfect servant. And we learned there that if you even look through the first two chapters, how many times the word immediately, and he did this, and he did that, and he did this, and forthwith and straightway. So he was always on the move. 
And of course, Matthew is the shortest uh, of the four Gospels, it's only 16 chapters. But then when you looked opposite the ox on the right side, I, on, from the left side to the right side, you have the lion. So we learned from Matthew, of course, the lion is the king of the beasts, right? And we learned from Matthew that, uh, remember the, uh, the uh, wise men, they came looking for him. And they said, where is he that is born king? So we learned that uh, from Matthew that he, we see the kingdom. So I just thought this would give us kind of a vis visual representation. Now, I don't know if they have square heads or whether they're rounded off. But anyway, just to have a visual. Now, we're going to learn something uh, a little more today. Uh, concerning this whole situation but let's just remember thinking of Matthew let's just look at Matthew for a second and you remember that in in chapter one verse one this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ the son of David the son of Abraham so right away we see David and we learned that the lineage uh, of Christ would be, uh, the throne of David would be forever, that that was a covenant made with David, and that uh, Christ would come through that lineage. But we also know that he was the son of Abraham. And when, when you uh, look at chapter 4, verse 14, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah is the prophet. So we know that everything that is written in the four Gospels is concerning prophecy and the prophecy that was prophesied uh, concerning Christ. I guess you guys can't turn on your mic, hey? The home church? Hey, Ernie. Hey. Yeah. You want wow, to? That's that's better. It feels like I'm not speaking to dead air when I hear okay. <laughs> when I hear people. It gives me a little more incentive. Okay. Okay, Aaron. So, and then we see uh, what the message was preached there. Uh, chapter 3, verse 2. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, it's interesting to note, if you look at Isaiah, and Isaiah is a book that is written... It's 66 chapters, right? And it's kind of like a mini Bible. And let's just look at... Um, I go back. Let's just look at Isaiah for a second. Now, you know that there's 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. Now, it's interesting to see that in if when you come to chapter 40... Uh, uh, chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So it's interesting to see that up to this point, uh, this coincides with Matthew. Chapter 40. Wow. Of Isaiah coincides with with Matthew, so you have the first thirty nine chapters, the first thirty nine books wow. of the Old Testament, and then you have chapter forty, which is uh, reflecting Matthew. Uh, anyway, so I just thought that was interesting to pass along. And then you come to Mark, of course, no no genealogy for Mark, right? Because all we care about a servant is that can he do the job? Can he do the work? And we think, you know, we, we went through this about straightway, straightway. So that, that's interesting. But the other interesting thing is, uh, let's just look at uh, chapter 1 of Mark, verse 40. Now, the thing about a servant is he doesn't mind getting his hands dirty, right? Ooh. And as we're going through Mark, I was, I noticed some things concerning the hands of the Savior. but. Just 41, 40, and there came a leper to him, beseeching him, kneeling down to him. 
-hmm. and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus mm -hmm. moved mm -hmm. with what? Compassion. Put forth his hand and touched him. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. a leper was to put a cloth over their face and cry, Unclean, unclean, right? Yes, Here Lord. this leper comes to the Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ is moved with compassion, and as a compassionate servant, he touched him, something that would defile a person if they touched him. And we see, even though he is a servant, um, he is God, and he... As soon as, as he had spoken, we have the word again. Immediately, the leprosy departed from him, and mm. he was clean. And straightly he charged him, forth went, sent him away. And he said, See, thou say nothing to any man, mm. but go thy way, show thyself to the priests, and offer for the cleansing those things which Moses mm. commanded for a testimony unto them. Just think, think of this. If they, had, if he, had, if that priest said they saw this man, and saw that he was cleansed of leprosy, the Lord fulfilled everything that the, he came not to. He came to fulfill the law, right? So he tells them what to do: do those things which Moses commanded thee for a testimony. Now, if that priest had seen this man, he probably never knew of any leper ever being cleansed. So what a, what a testimony it would have been to Israel that they had, they accepted what Christ had done as the lowly servant. Then we come to Luke. And if you, each man, as this was something I, was, I didn't mention the last time, but I was thinking about it over the last couple of weeks. You have you have Matthew. Um, you have okay. Where was that verse? Anyways, he was he was in the. Okay, I'm sorry to jump around, and my mind's kind of bouncing around here. But it's, these are such wonderful things. Let's go back to Matthew nine for a minute. Matthew 9, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto them, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now, Matthew 9, verse 9. Matthew 9, verse 9. Sorry. Matthew, Elizabeth says, remember, before I got on today, Ernie, go slow, speak slow. Okay. <laughs> Listen to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned that over 38 years. Listen to her. Yeah. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew. So think of this. The writer of Matthew, here's this man, a publican despised by fellow Jews, working for a kingdom, Caesar's kingdom, collecting taxes. And the Lord stops and calls him, this man in the, uh, sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said, follow me. He is now going to trans be transformed, and he is going to be what? He's going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. No longer working for the kingdom of Caesar, but now he's going to be working for Christ. And, and you know, in chapter 10, when he goes, he commanded them going out and uh, chapter, sorry, chapter 10, verse 7. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So here we have a man who worked for another kingdom. He's called by Christ. And now he's going to write the gospel that portrays the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you have Matthew, uh, sorry, um, Mark, and you know that John Mark, he, he was a servant. He served with Paul. He served. He served. So he is writing the gospel from a servant's point of view. When we come to Luke, now Luke, Luke. as Paul calls him, the beloved 
physician and here's a doctor. And, you know, the, the uh, details that you get in, in Luke are wonderful. I mean, it starts out, it doesn't start right, right away with Christ. It starts with Zacharias and the birth of John the Baptist. So we have a miracle birth because they couldn't have children. But then we have a miraculous birth of Christ through, and he describes and it tells us that she was a virgin, that we think of how that Christ came into the world through the, what we call incarnation, that is spirit, the spirit taking on flesh. When you think of how you talk about translation, you know, in church, they talked about translational, the greatest translation was Christ coming from eternity and stepping into the realm of time mm. yeah. so that we just read in in mark that he had so he could have compassion and show physically what perfection was and what mm. truth was and what life was right mm. so anyways we come to luke and then we have the miraculous birth of christ but we see the the um genealogy of of in luke and when when we look at his the description of his genealogy he goes from christ backwards right yeah. and mm -hmm. so and where does he end verse 38 of chapter 3 of luke i should give luke 3 chapter 38 i mean verse 38 which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now, <laughs> I mean, you know, you get all these left-leaning liberal Christians who, you know, who poo-poo creation in the first chapters of Genesis. Well, here we have Christ validating creation mm -hmm. adam he goes right back to adam he doesn't stop uh you know in verse thir uh, verse 31 which was the son of david so there you have the king mm -hmm. he doesn't stop at abraham but he goes right back to adam now that's going to be important because when we fill in paul's section of the chart that's going to be so kind of lock that in your mind and remember that the physician the the beloved physician who gave such detail concerning christ uh was written by luke the physician uh when you think of um okay i should have wrote that down but anyway uh twice Pilate says, I find no fault in him. There's nothing I find in this man that uh, concerning uh, what you've said about him. But he tries to uh, wiggle out of it, right? And they say to him, you know, if you let this man go, that is Jesus, thou art not Caesar's friend. So for polit political reasons, he scourges Jesus. And when you you when we come to John now, John is considered of the four writers, uh, the theologian. And rightly so, because look at the way John starts his book. In the beginning was the word. Sorry, John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word, capital W. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Now, mm. if, you, if you look at other translations, the modern wacky stuff, it'll say through him, like he was some sort of conduit. But it says here that it was made by him. All things were made by him. And without him, without Christ, was not anything made that was made. But when you look at verse 14, 
and the word was made flesh. So we've learned from Luke how that all took place. So John doesn't go through that, but he makes uh, the beautiful statement uh, in, you know, the study of theology, the study of God. He writes, and the word, capital W, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now he adds in parentheses, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace, that is grace towards Israel, unmerited favor to Israel, because at this point they're in the fifth cycle of punishment, they're dispersed, they're in in a mess, but grace came by Jesus Christ. And we saw one action of grace there when he touched the leper and healed him. So with that in mind, in the four faces that we have, we had with the, uh, the, the beings in heaven, we have the fourfold uh, unfolding of the person of Christ. He was the king. He was the perfect servant. He was the perfect man, and he was God manifest in flesh. So when you come to the end of John, the theologian, he writes this word, these words. <clears throat> the very last, well, the, the last verse of chapter 20, the last verse of chapter 20, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. And then verse 25 of chapter 21, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, that which if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain, mm. could not contain the books that should be written. Mm. Amen. So, you know, last time we were together, we went through all the I am's of John and John picks certain things to, for certain reasons to display the person of, our, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of our savior. So we see him as king. We see him as servant. We see him as a man. We see him as God. And he reflects all those things that were uh, seen in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 1. But let's go back to Ezekiel again. Problem is I can't find Ezekiel. Okay. There. <laughs> there. <cry>. Ezekiel. <laughs> I had a little bookmark in it. I should have just uh, went with that. So in verse 28, we find out. Yeah, what chapter, Ernie? Oh, I'm sorry. Chapter 28. Okay. Give us a second. Yeah, sorry. Ezekiel okay. chapter 28, verse 14. All right. All right. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth and i have set thee so thou wast upon the holy mountain of god thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of the fire thou was perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee mm. uh, verse 16 uh just the last part O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of the fire, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings and so on. Uh, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries, uh, the multitude of iniquities by the iniquity of thy traffic. So we see here, what happened? Let's let's go back to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. 
verse, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, mm. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Well, that's what he thought. Mm. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Mm. So now we have an understanding of this one so we have these four cherubs right around the throne and then i got <laughs> i got another little piece of lego from my daughter's old duplo and i'm going to use this green it was part of a tree <laughs> as the covering cherub okay so while you had these four around <laughs> and then you had the covering cherub the visual too green with envy <laughs> <laughs> hey that's good i never thought of that. and so he we see that he is lifted up in pride until iniquity until sin entered and as we know the problem with sin is the letter i right it's right in the middle i and the problem with pride is that i is right in the middle of pride right so we see here the proudness the pride of lucifer i will i will i will okay i'm man i'm 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 out of time but listen let, let's just connect this and then uh i'm gonna throw it over to lenny now but let's just go to first corinthians and we are going to learn something or at least i'm you know i these are just things I'm learning too. And it is, it's just so exciting. You know, when, when you start reading the scripture and, and making connections, right. And I was saying to my wife today, now, I don't know, you might not agree with me on this, but I was thinking we were just chatting out loud and, you know, I was thinking, and it hit me this morning as I was thinking, thinking about the scripture, the 13 epistles of Paul. And you know how, like, I won't say, but certain groups, they have a special month this month, right? And how that they'll throw out and say, you know, Jesus never condemned that way of life or something like that, right? But when you come to Romans 1, it's, it, it's condemned. I mean, Paul makes no bones about it, right? Think about this. What if they brought out a Bible? And took out Paul's 13 epistles. I mean, that would be devastating. We, you know, you could search. Now, I remember Richard Jordan said, you know, you can search the scriptures till your eyeballs fall out on the page. Yep. You're not going to find the mystery in prophecy. Mm -hmm. But we find the mystery in Paul. So let's look at uh 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And let's read it verse 5. Well, let's let's read let's read verse 3. Well, let's let's start at the beginning of the chapter. Chapter <laughs> 2. I'm sorry, it's just so <laughs> exciting. Okay, and I, 1 Corinthians okay. chapter 2. And oh, I, yeah. brethren, came to you not with excellency, excellency of speech mm. or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, mm. save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness. And in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, mm. but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith mm. should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, I've never been, 
you know, in these last three, three years, I, I've never been amongst a group of people like our fellow right dividers who go back to the scripture for everything mm. we believe and everything we say. Amen. And I mean, it's so wonderful that we can read this together and, and be agreed that this is God's word in the King James Bible. But anyways, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. Now, this is what I want you to pay attention to nor of the print nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. for we speak the wisdom of god in a mystery mm. even the hidden wisdom which god ordained before the world unto glory verse eight i want to just put a magnifying glass on this today which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it they would not have crucified the Lord, Lord of glory. Satan, as he was lifted up in pride, and I will be above the most high. I mean, he had no idea. And what does it say? It was verse 7. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, this column here under Paul on your chart. Now, I know this term is not used in the Bible, but we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and, you know, it's loosely referred to as the four Gospels. I would submit to you that we want to now study the fifth gospel. Amen. Right? So let's go to Romans 16 and you give it, get ready, uh, Lenny, because I'm going to end on this. We're not, we're not going to get the filling <laughs> Paul's chart today, but we'll do it next time. Okay. Aaron. But listen to this verse 25. I mean, you, you all know this, but mm -hmm. I just, I mean, it just sums up what we've been talking about right now. Verse 25 of chapter 15, uh, 16, 16, chapter 16. Now to him that is the power to establish you according to what? My gospel. gospel. What did we read right at the beginning of the lesson? Second Timothy 2, that he was raised again according to my gospel. <laughs> and this is the exciting part. Because everything that we've studied about the four Gospels next time, if the Lord hasn't come, uh, we're going to look and see that Paul sees every one of these things in his epistles, but oh. in a different light. Whoa. Okay? okay. Remember the cherub that covereth, right? Yeah. Right? Awesome. So yeah. if we use our, our little our little Lego thing. So we have the prophets, right? We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's four building blocks. But we have this block that comes in and we won't, we won't lock it in this week until we fill in the chart. But it says, it says on there, Jesus Christ to Paul. Amen. And this is going to interlock with these, and it's going to be like a capstone of truth that completes wow. the whole message that God wants us to know. And everything that God wants us to know is in between these two covers. Wow. Yeah. And we are yeah. such a fortunate people to, to know and to know the scripture. So I'm going to leave this little poem with you concerning the word of God. My pail, I'm often dropping deep down into this well. That's the Bible. It never touched the bottom. 
however deep it fell. And though I keep on dipping, and by study, by faith, and by prayer, I have no power to measure the living water there. And that's, that's what we do when we come together Beautiful. as a group of believers. We plumb the depths of the word of God, and we find that we never, we'll never come to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. And when we think of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. Mm -hmm. Remember the servant, mm -hmm. that ye through his poverty might be rich. And I tell you, we're the richest people on earth today. Mm, amen. Beautiful. Amen. Okay, Lenny. Ernie, that was great, Ernie. Thank you. Am I muted?